All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we are connecting today um, from New York City here in the Iron USA office. Happy Giving Tuesday to everybody who is watching on Zoom or is following us on um, Facebook tonight. We're excited to get our second webinar of the day underway. We are featuring um, six fantastic SDGs that all have one concern in mind, the environment. I'd like to first begin with a few thank yous. Thank you to everyone joining us today for this webinar. Thank you to everyone who has engaged with us over the past 17 days with our SDG social media campaign. And thank you to everyone who has donated to Iron USA so far for Giving Tuesday. We are grateful to have you as a part of our iEARN community. Our second webinar of the day celebrates iEARN's work on environmental awareness. You will hear directly from experienced iEARN educators and youth who are taking action to address these environmentally focused SDGs. Guests include Jennifer Rose and one of her students, Megan Ogrens, as well as Kathy Boziak, um, all from the U.S., and Margaret Chen from Taiwan. Um, I'll give a full introduction of all of them in just a little bit. They will share their classroom experiences implementing iron projects that focus on the environment. Before we begin, Let's go over a quick review of some of the features in this Zoom webinar room so all attendees can navigate and participate seamlessly. So you have um, a chat box that you should have access to. Um, please make sure in your chat box that your settings are set to all panelists and participants so that you can send your messages to everybody who is watching as well as the panelists. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and quickly type an introduction into the chat box. Let us know where you are connecting from and who you are. Um, we, in just a minute, will launch a poll to see who's in the room. Um, we are also live on Facebook um, shortly, I believe. And so um, a hello and welcome to those of us, those of you that may be following us on, fa on Facebook. We are also recording this webinar, so if you miss something or you would like to share it out with somebody else, um, you can visit our website at us.iron.org. It'll be posted on YouTube or our Facebook page to be able to watch again. So let, let's kick off this webinar with a quick poll. I'd like to see um, who is here today, and if you are, Great, so let us know if you are an educator, if you are a student, you are an iron classroom joining, a yes, yes or Nisley alum, let us know. All right, I see our polls coming in. Um, we have quite a few educators with us today, a few students, um, and some others joining us. So welcome to everybody who's joining us today. I am going to pass things over to my colleague, Julia, who is going to give us an introduction about iEARN, some of our programs, and the SDGs that they are related to. Switch, that's not working. Oh, Julia, you're muted. And unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit more about iEARN um, and our programs. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm having a tiny bit of technical difficulty here. One second. Okay, great. 
Um, so IRON um, was founded in 1988 as a way to connect um, classrooms in uh, what was the former Soviet Union and um, classrooms in New York City. Um, it was a way to build, um, build peace in a way when those our two countries couldn't connect with each other. Um, and it was all founded by Peter Copen. Um, and it has since grown to a huge network of educators and youth in 140 countries uh, around the world. Um, And um, we, ha we have um, over 50,000 educators and 2 million youth around the world connecting together on IRON Global Projects. Uh, and in addition to IRON's um, Global Projects, we also work in partnership with a number of institutions, um, including um, working on two uh, programs sponsored by the U.S. Department of State, and one of those is the National Security Language Initiative for Youth, um, NISLI, which sends high school students abroad for a summer or an academic year to learn uh, languages that are critical for diplomacy around the world. Um, you can learn more about the NISLI program at um, nisliforyouth.org. Iron also, our new USA staff also manage the NISLI interactive site, which hosts virtual events um, for um, students on program and alum. In addition to NISLI, Iron also works on the YES and YES Abroad programs, which are also sponsored by the US Department of State. Uh, and the YES programs bring students from majority Muslim countries to spend an academic year in the US and to also do service work in the communities they are placed in and as well as to live with host families. Um, so if you wanna learn more, uh, you can visit at one of the websites listed on this page, um, or if you go to the IRON website, um, you can find out information about all these programs. Um, and we're also always looking for host families to host these wonderful students um, on, this, on the YES program. Um, and the YES Abroad program um, is reciprocal and sends US students abroad to some of the same countries. And now I'm going to share a little bit about Iron Global Projects. Uh, <clears throat> Iron Projects are all teacher designed and facilitated. Um, so they're, um, they fit well with curriculum in your classroom and in educators' classrooms. Um, we currently have more than 100 different projects that classrooms can collaborate on. Um, the primary way that classrooms participate is through a synchronous interaction on the Iron Collaboration Center, which is a safe and password protected uh, website, um, which encourages discussions and sharing of media, photos um, on the Collaboration Center. Um, and in addition, we encourage uh, classrooms to participate in live exchanges. Um, using video means, um, for example, like Zoom, where we're on right now, or other, other devices. Um, the All Iron projects are integrated with one or more of the sustainable development goals, which were set by the United Nations. Um, these are goals that were set to be achieved by the year 2030. Uh, many countries have adopted these goals as a way to work together to make the world a better place. Um, today, we'll be focusing on a few sustainable of the global goals, the sustainable development goals today that focus on the environment. Um, these goals include goal SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, 
SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, SDG 13, Climate Action, SDG 14, Life Below Water, and SDG 15, Life on Land. Great, thank you so much, Julia. Before we jump into the projects and hearing from our speakers, I do want to do one um, last poll to see um, for those of you that are here today, have you ever done a project related to the environment? So go ahead and let us know if you've ever been a part of a project that's related to the environment. Yes, not yet, and I'm planning one now. I just realized I was muted. Um, great, we have quite a few people who um, have participated in an environmentally focused project, um, and we have a couple not yet. So hopefully for those of you who have not participated in one, you'll get some inspiration and um, information about different environmentally related projects that you can join today. All right, so I would also like to share um, very quickly a few of the iEARN projects in our network that are related to environmental issues. As Julia shared, we have over 100 iEARN global collaborative projects that are taking place this year across the world. And many of those projects, um, students are addressing one of these SDGs related to the environment. I pulled some of the really strong ones that I want to spotlight and share with you. You can see them on the screen here. Um, there is Water is Life. Um, which we are going to feature today. We are also featuring Go Me on Earth today, um, as well as Earth Stewardship, but we have a lot of robust projects and activities going on in Don't Waste Create, Decarbonize, Decolonize, Drastic Plastics, Design Squad Global, which is an engineering and STEM project, Every Day is Earth Day, um, Solar Cooking, and youth can projects where students are um, engaging in their own service projects that are related to the environment. So if you are interested in learning more about any of these projects or other iron projects, um, feel free to visit iEarn.org and you can search for any of these projects. So um, I would like to introduce our guest panelists this evening. We are joined tonight by three iron educators. Um, one is, um, we have three iron educators and one student with us today. Um, I'm gonna take just a quick second to make sure we have all of them up on video and ready to go so I can introduce them. All right, great. And then I'm just gonna ask Margaret if you wanna try to turn on your video and hopefully we'll have it working this time. Great. Okay, fantastic. So we have all of our panelists with us today. Um, I want to introduce each of them quickly to you. Um, the first is Jennifer Rose, if you wanna wave so you can see who Jennifer is. Um, Jennifer has been a seventh grade global studies teacher for 18 years. She teaches at Helen Keller Middle School in Easton, Connecticut. She is a Fund for Teachers Fellow and a National Geographic Certified Educator. She has a BA of Social Sciences in Secondary Education and an MS in Curriculum and Instruction, as well as Global Studies and Education. Jennifer has been an IRON member since 2015 and currently serves as a Global Education Ambassador for IRON USA. She has participated in many projects, including Water is Life Project, Earth Stewardship, Talking Kites Around the World, Girl Rising, and Beauty of the Beasts. All right, I would also like to introduce our next educator, um, who is Margaret Chen. Margaret, if you wanna give everybody a wave. Margaret is joining us from Taiwan um, this evening, and it is actually tomorrow morning for her. 
Margaret Chen is the country coordinator of Iron Taiwan, as well as the chief of experiment and research section at, and I'm sorry, Margaret, I'm not going to pronounce this right, at Kaohsiung Municipal Jiangsing Junior High School. Margaret received her PhD in education from National Sun Yat-sen University. She has 26 years of experience teaching in public junior high school and has joined iEARN since 2006. She has participated in many, many projects over the years, including Holiday Card Exchange, One Day in the Life, Teddy Bear Project, Folk Tales, Heart to Heart, Magical Moments, Side by Side, School Uniform Exchange, My Name Around the World, Kindred Project, um, Natural Disaster Youth Summit, Computer Chronicles, Finding Solutions to Hunger, Staying Healthy, Water is Life, and the Cultural Exchange Package. And next, I would like to introduce Kathy Boziak. Um, Kathy is a science teacher at Lincolnton High School in North Carolina. She has been teaching for over 20 years and is very passionate about project-based learning and connecting her students to the world. She is an IRON project facilitator and currently serves as a global education ambassador for IRON USA. She has participated in the Global Zoo Project, Solar Cookers, Go Me on Earth, and Daffodils and Tulips. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our um, student of the evening, Megan. I'm gonna give everybody a wave. Megan is a, currently a sophomore in high school. She participated in the Water as Life project when she was in seventh and eighth grade. Global issues pertaining to water and other concerns continue to impact her life. After returning from a family trip to Namibia, the Okavango Delta, and Atosha National Park last summer, Megan put together a photography exhibit called Close Up Atosha and raised $500 selling hand-drawn cards to donate. Her hope is to help with animal research and improve efforts to resolve the water competition problem between people and elephants. And this um, all ties back to her experience in the Water is Life project, which she is going to share about today. So welcome um, to all of you panelists. Um, and the way that this is going to work this evening is we are going to share a little bit about iron projects and the components that make up an iron project and allow for each presenter to share about their experience um, directly in the classroom. So for those of you that are not um, familiar with iron projects, all of the iron projects are very unique and diverse and look different in every classroom. But each project, or all of the projects, have four very similar components. Um, and every student and teacher that experiences an iron project will most likely experience one of these four, or all of these four components when they have an iron project experience. So they start with project selection and figuring out what projects makes the most sense for them, learning more about that project and what it's about. Then um, students engage in classroom activities that are typically um, modeled off of project-based learning. So they are doing various hands-on activities in the classroom that are aligned with that project's topic and SDG. Um, another main and essential component to all IRON projects are the global partnerships and virtual exchange that occurs. So in addition to doing project-based learning in the classroom, students are connecting with other classrooms and peers around the world, collaborating on these topics, sharing their ideas and resources, and engaging in some form of virtual exchange um, between countries. And lastly, um, a very essential component to project-based learning is sharing your work with a wider, more authentic audience. And so all IRON projects encourage some form of final product and exhibition of their work to showcase and share out the work that students have completed in their projects. Great, so we are going to get started on our panel um, with project selection. So I would like each of you, um, if you can tell us about the project that you participated in, what it was, what it was about, and then any information about your process for selecting that project. So uh, I chose Water is Life. This is my first time with iEARN, and 
Um, obviously, I wanted to be successful, but what was really important to me is that the curriculum that um, the project laid out had a very clear outline of objectives and activities. It was project-based, and it was a very manageable time frame. There was weekly activities. The expectations were very clear, so I felt that I would be able to manage that with my students and we could be successful. It was collaborative, interactive, on that global platform, um, as Rachel also noted. And it really fit into the school curriculum, even though the rest of the students were studying. So we do um, global studies. The rest of the students were studying about a different uh, country around the world. But it fit into our essential questions. Students are expected to be able to answer how does what we know about our interconnected world shape our beliefs and actions? So that was really, really a perfect fit. And then I also like the fact that even though it was on a global scale, the project asked that you look at it from a local level first. So all of the other schools were sharing a, a global, a local issue and how it impacted um, globally. So that was really, really important. I think a real big feature of this project. So we studied the Long Island Sound and Connecticut Rivers, but we're able to expand that to um, a global scale. Hello. Um, I also selected What is Life. Um, my students and I participated in Water is Life in 2016. Um, it's a project based on SDG 6 and SDG 14. Um, at that time, my students were seventh graders and new to IAM projects. In Taiwan, we have two semesters in a school year. For the students that are first doing IAM, I usually choose communication-oriented projects in the first semester focusing on developing intercultural communication skills. Then in the second semester, uh, we get further to do research-oriented projects, doing deep investigation and that met an action plan to deal with the important issues in our daily life. So in 2016, when I looked for a project for my second semester, I got an email from Virginia. She and I in Australia plan to launch a new project, Water is Life. And the project encourages students to study water problem in a local community and then turn the study into actions to make a difference. This is a research and action-oriented project. It met my teaching needs. Besides, uh, Taiwan is an island country in the Pacific Ocean. Conserving the ocean and marine resources is a very important issue for, for us. And in the recent years, we always have the problem of water shortage. Water is Life provided a very good opportunity for students to study our own water problems and also think about these problems from global perspectives. And the most important is that from my project experience, I know an Australia team always provides strong support to project participants. That made me feel competent to join this new project. So I decided to take part in Water is Life. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Kathy. It sounds like your mic isn't working. Unmuted, but we can't hear you. If you want to check the connection. Oh. No. Oh, yep. Oh, perfect. Right. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time, and I, I, I like you said earlier, I'm a firm believer in project-based learning. But I, but I also understand that there's a different. Sometimes you have students coming in at different levels, and they don't understand the sort of the freedom that goes with project-based learning. And so this one, you know, I listed two different SDG goals, but there's actually about five of them that is covered under this particular topic, and I like 
the fact that again, you know, you have a guideline if you don't, if you're if you're uncertain of what you'd like to do. It is across the board open for everything from kindergarten to I'm going to use it with my AP students in the spring um, because you can do as much as you would like to do. Um, Gomi looks at garbage and Gomi looks at what's going on with garbage and part of the process of, of making students understand what's going on with the environment is making them aware. And so I chose Gomi because that absolutely makes them aware they will do some tracking and then turn around and collaborate with somebody on another, you know, another level and talk to students in other countries about what their garbage is like and why don't you have as much garbage as we have or why do you have more than we have? Um, so I think those are very, very important things. It's Again, a, a, a very manageable thing. I think um, Jennifer mentioned that earlier, and that's a lot of the, the things that go on with most of the iron projects. You can do as little or as much as you want, come up with an end product. And the end product, again, varies from, from student to student. This one, and we'll show you guys at the end, this one is, is, um, has got a number of different projects. But I think the other part of it too is that, as with Jennifer, it answers the question, how does what we know about garbage change our perspective, you know, and, and how does it change our behavior with regard to what we produce is trash. Um, so I like this. It, it introduces a lot of things, but you can take it and put it on a really in-depth level if you choose to. And so for, for us, Earth Stewardship was part of the bridge um, program. There was, in the bridge program, there's five different projects that students can participate in. And I had a couple students that were really interested in this. We do have a small school garden, and this was gonna be a way for, for me, because I manage the garden club, to really get in those garden beds and do some soil sampling and, and figure out a way to remediate, but also teach the rest of the students about the importance of growing our own food in our community. We have a a rural community, but we're just one hour outside of the city. So it's really easy to take that um, for a bit, for, to, you know, for, um, for granted. But again, with this program, the curriculum is, is clearly outlined with objectives and activities. And as a teacher, that is just so helpful. It's project-based. It, worked on a lot of the um, development goals. The platform is very interactive and that is always a, um, a huge plus. And again, it was really easy to implement into our curriculum and the essential question that it answered for us in this case, in addition to the other one, but how does, we, how does what we know about our interconnected world shape our beliefs and actions? And, that's something that I've seen in the last couple of years at our school and around the state, um, really that, that action piece and that, you know, gaining awareness, but not just having that awareness, but actually what does that awareness do to what we believe and, and how we act. And this was very, um, very hands-on, which was very exciting. Great, thank you so much for giving us an introduction to all of those great projects and what went into your thinking in selecting um, a project that makes sense for your students. So next we're going to move on to classroom activities. Can each of you share about what classroom activities were conducted during each of these projects? Hi, um, so in my class, we researched threats to Connecticut rivers, like the Naugatuck River, which is especially close to us, um, and then also pollution in the sound. And we found that the biggest threats to our water quality around us was um, pollution, waste, and overuse. So pollution surprisingly didn't just come from uh, like industrial uh, waste and like factories dumping waste into rivers or the sound. Uh, a lot of it actually we found came from people's garbage to and littering and also um, runoff so when water would carry um, pesticides or fertilizer from farms or even people's lawns down to the water. Um, 
we also took some community action in our school. Um, we presented in small groups of two to three to other classes about the Water is Life project uh, in hopes of raising more awareness, um, at least in our school. And then uh, at our school also, we hosted like this um, advisory color wars. And so we, do, uh, we did this thing in middle school where um, everyone is assigned a different color, yellow, white, or blue. Um, and each different color is a team. So we would have different bins uh, for each color at lunch and whichever one recycled the most and wasted the least got ice cream at the end. So that was the motivator. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the classroom activity about water is, is life uh, in my classroom is, um, you can see water is life is a learning circle model project. Um, you can see on the slide, it has a very clear project structure. The facilitators set up the timeline and determine the main work in each stage. Then each participant school made their own project plans. I met my IM club students only once a week. When there was a school activity or an exam, we had to stop the project. So I arranged another project timeline for my students to balance project activities and school learning. During the process, first the students introduce themselves and learn to use the project wiki. Then they work in group to carry out research on water crisis in Taiwan. The students presented the research in class, had a discussion, and make final reports to share on the wiki. Uh, they thought water shortage is the most urgent problem, and so each of them made their own water saving plans, invited family members to join, and started to take an action in their daily life. They kept their water saving record and make a reflection every week. So now that, let me show you a short video from my students. So just one moment and we'll get the video up. Hello, I'm Joanne. Hi, I'm Jessica. We did a water is life project three years ago, and that time we had a deeper understanding about the water shortage situation in Taiwan, and we thought about the method to save water. Eventually, we created a story to tell people how to practice them in daily life. Water is life lets me aware of water problems. Think about a way to save water and try to change the world. So, really an incredible memory for both of us. Also, I have learned a lot about the way to save water resources and the fact about water shortage. After doing that, we often remind ourselves and people around us do not waste water. That's all the passion we have for the project. project. See ya! All right. Am I am I functional to this time? Can yep. you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so with Gomi on Earth, uh, it's it, what's been popping up in the chat box is Gomi is actually uh, the Japanese word for trash. And so what I encourage people to do when I talk about Gomi is I encourage them just to put the word Gomi up on the board and ask the kids what they think it means. And it's, it's really interesting the types of feedback that you get on that. But Gomi is actually broken down into three parts. In the first part, you're a Gomi detective and you follow the journey of Gomi through your life. Um, so you look at, and you can break it down into a lot of different ways, but essentially what you do is you look at the trash that you produce in you yourself. And then you look at the trash that your family produces and then you follow, where does it go? You know, does it just because it goes into the trash can doesn't mean it's gone away, which is what a lot of kids think. Um, and so they can actually do a number of different activities with that. They can build maps to follow where it's going. They can, uh, 
if you if it's an older group of students they can track the actual amount as in pounds of of garbage that they've done um so that that's sort of a, a wide open you know piece to it you know where does it go how does it get there who picks it up do you take it yourself is there a cost for it why is it going there why aren't you reusing it or recycling it the second part of it is you take it from your home and your community to the world and you start looking at things like okay so now it's in the ocean now what happens um well you start creating things like gomi belts and garbage patches in the center of all of the oceans and you start having you know different trash wash up on shores where it didn't start um one of the great activities that you can do with that is there's a there's an activity about some ducks that washed over rubber ducks that washed overboard from a big tanker during a storm and you can actually track where the ducks ended up you know and in places that you wouldn't have expected um you can look at gomi mountains which are landfills um, and, and what some people have done with them to actually turn them into, you know, parks and, and how do you reclaim this area that was once a landfill. One of the newer things that you look at is things like microplastics. Um, you know, trash is one thing, but now we're starting to, to understand that the ocean's full of microplastics and that's, that's something that's going to be much more difficult to clean up. So that's the, the GOMI world or the world GOMI reality. The third part of it is you're now the activist what part of this really bothers you? And here's where the, where the project-based learning really plays into it. How can you fix it? What can you do in your small little corner of the world to change what's going on? And it, and it can be something as simple as going and talking to a younger class, you know, a younger group of students. It can be writing letters to people. It can be, uh, and I'll show you a little bit later under some of the products, but, you know, it, it can be just as simple as looking at your own life and how do you cut back on what you've done. So. Go me on earth, the opportunities for different things in class are limitless as far as only your imagination, your students' imagination, and what's important to them and you to get the whole point of, you know, educating about what we're actually doing with trash across to them. And then also, Margaret, I don't want to underscore the importance of in that classroom activity for water is life also is that big piece of going into the workspace into the collaborative workspace that iron sets up for all of the projects where you're posting research you're showing your pictures you're asking questions and students are weekly or bi-weekly depending on the length of the project really interacting with other students who are part of the project and they'll be in the same um, country or they'll be globally. So that, that's really very exciting. I, I don't wanna underscore that because that's really, that's the whole point of this. Um, but so in Earth Stewardship, we had to go and different schools did it in different ways, but we actually studied the soil in our garden beds. Other students studied um, soil around their, community or around their school but after we learned that our soil really in the garden beds was very very sandy and very very silty then we took it on to start collecting food scraps in the cafeteria and we composted it and then in the spring we had this compost we remediated the soil and we had some fresh soil for our our spring garden so that was really um really exciting Great, thank you for giving us a peek into what the students are doing in the classroom during these projects. And I know it's, it's, it's even more than that. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can integrate this work into the classroom and make it work for your curriculum and what your, what your students need and then connect it back to the project theme and the SDGs. So in addition to students taking um, part in project-based learning and hands-on activities in the classroom like you just heard. Um, they're also engaging with global peers through virtual exchange and iron. So they are either signing into the collaboration center and posting about their work. Um, they might be having video conferences to meet one another. They might be sharing presentations and findings from their work. 
Um, so I would love for each of you to share a little bit more about um, your global partners during your project time. So when I did Water is Life in 2015, there were more than 25 different, well, 25 different countries participating. So Virginia from Australia who organized the project, she broke us down into small groups. So in our collaboration, we partnered with Australia, Uganda, there was um, two schools from the United States and Taiwan. And that was just really exciting to see how we treated water differently in different parts of the world. And yet we all treated it. had similar issues. We would give that a try. Oh, sorry, Jennifer, I think we're losing you. Let's Am I back? Your, yeah, let's try your mic again. Okay, great. I'm not sure that what you missed, and I, I, I don't want to um, waste anybody's time, but just it's really dynamic learning about how different groups of people experience water around the world and, and we were also interacting with high school students, middle school students, and elementary school students. So that was great. Yeah, on, in to, in to 2016, about 20 schools uh, from nine countries joined the Water Is Life project. As Jennifer said, the facilitators divided the schools into several groups. So our partners were from Iran, Tunisia, and Australia. And besides the collaboration center, Water Is Life had its own wiki platform. We mainly communicated with our partners on the wiki. So we didn't have synchronous interaction like video conference, only asynchronous activities on wiki. So on the wiki, we shared research, actions, and also read the partner's posts and get comments on them. I think this is very important. That's the interaction. All these posts were authentic materials. Students could understand the real situations in different parts of the world, made a comparison, and analyze the water issues from diverse perspectives. My students said in their reflection that uh, they found water problem is not is a global issue, not only in Taiwan. So everyone needs to do something. So they share their local experience with their foreign peers and also them from others to think what they can do more. So I, I think this is the power of collaboration. So everyone, everyone take a small step. Um, it is possible for all of us to make a difference together. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, well, I mean, my slide's up there, and then you can obviously see that there's been at least 30, you know, plus countries participating in Gomi on Earth over the past number of years that this has been around. But, you know, I want to take this a little bit sideways because we can all say the same thing about collaboration and about global partners and, and learning what's going on in other countries with the same area of study that our kids are, are looking at. But I think the other part that we're that we need to get across to people is the fact that it's going to allow our students to understand that they're all in this together and that they're all students and that they're all experiencing the same issues and that they're all experiencing life in general together. And I think that's a very powerful thing when we're trying to talk about, you know, creating a generation of global citizens. Um, one of the things that, that my kids, we also do the solar cooker project, and one of the things that my kids came to me uh, after she did some posting on the forum, she said, you know, I, I don't, I'm really confused because I, I talked about a s'more, and, and the student that I was talking to who happened to be in Iran said, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think 
that in and of itself, you know, whether it's whether it's a, an environmental project or whether it's any other project that IRN offers, which they're all fabulous, um, is that it gives our students the power to collaborate and to understand and to empathize and to be part of a bigger thing than just where they are. Um, and so, you know, I apologize for going a little bit sideways with that because we're all going to say the same thing about our projects as far as, you know, the collaborations and how fabulous, because they are, and the, and the fabulousness of experiencing that environmental piece of it. But I think it goes deeper than that. And I think that, you know, you know, everybody that's involved in this particular, you know, webinar right at the moment needs to understand that and take that back to the, to the folks that they're trying to convince to be part of these things, you know, so. That's my two cents. So in Earth Stewardship, we partnered with, this was um, the Middle East and Northern Africa, but there was also another um, school from the United States that we were able to have a virtual exchange with. And just one of the great things about this, it was, eye-opening for my students. We had a virtual exchange with an inner city school and how they, how they treated the need um, for soil was just so differently because they, did, they didn't have green grass and trees everywhere like we do. They, they have um, cement and just were really hungry for spaces around their school community to to build gardens so again it was just a very eye-opening experience but and they could see you know what other students were were dealing with and then even in sharing with the postings with the students from africa and egypt just looking at those pictures and just seeing how they're very, very dry and, and, and the opposite. And, and some of those conversations that they were having with their global peers was really fun for, for the students. And they did get that recognition that, you know, wow, we, we are all very similar, even though we, we face uh, different challenges. It was nice to be able to do that. Great. Thank you for sharing about your global partners and who was involved in the project. And I think that showcases well that IRON projects um, are multi-classroom connections. So you could have anywhere from two classrooms to 20 classrooms in 20 different countries joining a project. And then many teachers make those connections, small group connections or one-to-one -one connections um, within those project groups. Great, so the last section of the evening, um, we want to showcase some of the final products and exhibitions. Um, before I jump into that, I do see some questions coming in the chat box, so I wanted to let everybody know that we will get to those at the end of this. Um, and if you do have questions for um, any of these fantastic educators or student, um, feel free to type them in the chat box, because following this next section, we will um, hopefully have a few minutes to open it up for any questions that you might have for them. So once students have um, done their classroom activities, they've engaged in collaboration with um, global partners. Um, they often wrap up their projects with some form of final product to, to showcase their work um, and an exhibition to share it with a wider authentic audience um, and really celebrate the work that they've done. So I would love for each of you to share a little bit about um, if your students did final products or any form of exhibition. Um, so about two years ago, um, my class went to the UN to present the research and activities of the Water is Life project. Um, we learned a lot, I think, just from having to prepare for it and making the slides. Uh, we learned about communication um, strategies and just like speaking skills, uh, making sure that we were talking clearly, like using hand gestures and stuff like that. Um, and then also, um, like my specific slides or schools that I focused on in it were um, St. Mark's Senior Secondary Primary School and um, they're in Mirabag, India and I also presented on uh, Sabah School in Iran. 
And it was interesting just watching our presentation over and over again in class, just as we would practice it, um, to learn more about um, and focus on the details of what all the other schools did because their final products were a lot different than what we did. Um, for example, St. Mark's Senior Secondary Primary School made a parade in their city um, to advocate for um, the water quality in their area and protection of their um, water, specifically Najafgar Lake, which was near to them. Um, and then on the other hand, we did our Color Wars activity and uh, Saba School and Iran even made banana filters for their water. Um, they used bananas to filter out heavy metals uh, from their water. So that was very cool to see. Thank you. Okay. Um, for my class, our final products are ebooks and oral presentation. And for the for the all participants, the final product of the project is a report of water. Uh, a report of water is life. The publication um, to promote awareness on the importance of water conservation. My students work together to create stories of water crisis and put their water saving tips and results into the ebooks. We publish the three ebooks on the project wiki and the school website. Um, you can see the Dongdong's water adventure, learning from the future and saving our water. The students uh, develop their cre create creation of uh, creativity to write the stories. And besides, uh, the students had an oral presentation in our school's annual research presentation event. About 90 students, several teachers and parents attended our presentation. Also, at the end of the project, uh, Water is Life planned a publication uh, to collect all the project work from different countries. Two of my students were interested in working with an Australia team to edit the publication. So I also joined the team to give my students help and support. I think this is a very important final product for the project uh, because it shows the students' hard work can be used to present the global students' collaboration and engagement on achieving SDGs and further spread the project's message to help more classes get involved, get involved in the Water, uh, water is Life project. Yeah. Um, in my classroom, I, I'm, I'm a very firm believer that my students decide what their final project is. Um, Project-based learning is me guiding them, and if I guide too much, then sometimes it doesn't always work quite the way it ought to. So the very first thing that I have them do as a final project sort of precursor is they do a reflection. You know, what worked for me? What did I learn from this? Um, did it make an impact on me at all? You know, that type of thing. But then I let them choose different things that they like to do, um, how to get their message across. And so one year I actually had a group that presented at um, a conference that was online called Global EdCon. And they took some of the work that they had done and some of the things that they had learned and actually ran a session um, on Global EdCon. I've had, I, we also have a, a club at our school called TED Ed Club, where the students put together their own TED Talks and talk about things that are, that they're passionate about. And so I had a student um, who became very involved with what she was doing and is in the process now right, of creating her own TED Talk. But if you, if you look on the screen, um, what you're looking at on the, on the left-hand side is just simply an organized beach trash collecting project that went on as a final you know, sort of a final project to show how much trash there was. And that's a group uh, from a school in Taiwan. Um, on the right hand side is another of my students work. She became very concerned with the amount of trash that she was generating just on her own. And so she put together a notebook where each page represents a single day and how much trash she individually created at school. And so she's now taken that and that's become something that she shared with the elementary school kids and um, She's she's still working on it. It's the notebooks about six inches thick, but so there's a lot of different products um, 
presentations are great, but if that's not where your kids are at, then don't, you know, then, then that's cool too. You know, it's, it's what works for them and how they can become activists and get their message across to people. So what you're looking at in the center um, is a quote from one of my ninth graders a couple of years ago, and that's his definition of trash. And that's what he came up with at the end of, of Gomi and didn't even think about it beforehand, had no clue, didn't bother him. Trash was trash. Somebody else picked it up. And then the quote down at the bottom is one of the middle school teachers um, after she participated in Gomi and she said, that's what it's all about. Everything starts with awareness. And so kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at your final products, you know, it, it is all about what the kids are going to portray to somebody else and how they're going to get their message across. And that's different sometimes for everybody, you know. So along with Earth Stewardship, last fall, so fall of 2017, all of my students participated in an I Earn project. So depending on the projects that they participated in, they became advocates for different activities that we put together for a Global Awareness Week. So some students, different groups of students were advocating for different things, but they rallied together to get the entire school to participate in a bunch of activities. And so part of Earth Stewardship, they were um, most heavily focused on reduce, reuse, recycle, because it's caring about the earth and climate change and sustainability. So that's just one piece of it, but all of the students picked up on, on different activities, but that was our, um, culminating event and we do that this is our third year that we've done that so it was really successful and starting to turn into a real school-wide program and, and we are um slow but sure starting to see some some changes in the way we attack things at our school we really recognized some of the things that we could really do better so this has been for the most part a real a positive experience Great. Um, we got some valuable insight and peek into the classrooms and what these final products and exhibitions look like. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time for additional questions, but I do want to address one that did come up in the chat box already, and then we will wrap things up. So Anna asked, how do I introduce these projects in my classroom if I'm new to iEARN? Um, and the logistics is obviously becoming an iron member so going to iron.org and becoming a member but i'm wondering if um any of the teachers on our panel today if one or two people want to answer um as far as strategies for introducing it to your students for the first time we'd love to hear from you um sure <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier. I think, you know, w particularly with Gomi, take, look at it, sort of digest it, break it into pieces on your own, and pick the pieces that you think will work for your classroom. Um, do a little bit of, of, you know, just kind of introduction about the topic in general. But really, honestly, the best way to do it is to just tell the kids, hey, we're going to do something really cool, and there's no right or wrong to it. You know, it's you experiencing and it's you exploring and it's you discovering. And I think, you know, no matter what age kid it is, they're all going to get excited about that. Um, I, get their, I get their attention. Like I said, I just put the word Gomi on the board and say, what is it? You know, um, so find a hook, find the hook that works for your kids and, and um, just kind of have at it. But, but I'm sure any of us would be more than happy to, you know, to connect up with you and, and talk with you about stuff too. So that shouldn't be a problem. You really have to get into that, you know, the project space and, and really look at that. And that will, just reading will, will give you some ideas on how to introduce it into your classroom. Just when you get on the space and, and see what other people are doing, that'll probably spark a way for you to get your students excited. 
and um, for me, I usually use the videos, the show video to inspire students at the beginning of the project. And I, I think the video is a good one of activity that, that will promote the discussion on the topic of the project. Then the students start to discuss, then we can advise the student to think up what they will do and uh, um, or do any kind of school, uh, classroom activity to have them like, get involved. So my suggestion is to try to do for the video that's so for your project you, you, you'd like to do. And I think that will be a good starting. One other, one other piece to sort of keep in the back of your minds. If, if you're excited about it, your mm. students will be excited about it. That's true. You know, if, if you think that it's amazing and you think that it's going to be fun and it's going to be something that's worthwhile, they will too. That's fantastic advice and a, a great note to end on um, because these projects are exciting and engaging and, and hands-on for our students. And um, I, I want to express, express our gratitude and thanks for, for all of you for coming on and sharing your experience. Um, and a special thanks to Megan for coming on as a student ambassador and sharing her experience in the project. It's, it's really inspiring to hear um, the work that you did in the project and then, and then following it. So to wrap up this evening, I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Lagaya, so that we can conclude our Giving Tuesday webinar events. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, a big, big thank you to all of our panelists, um, Kathy, Jennifer, Margaret, and Megan. You really um, inspired um, uh, the listeners and participants to, um, I think, start thinking creatively about how to incorporate um, online project-based learning in their classrooms and addressing um, SDGs related to the environment. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, and if you are inspired um, to give back to uh, our community or to your earth um, by doing projects, um, we also uh, would, would really um, love it if you could also think about other ways of giving on this Giving Tuesday. Um, so uh, Giving Tuesday is a day that is all about giving, um, giving your time um, by volunteering, um, and also uh, giving, um, if you don't have time, uh, but would still like to give, um, we really encourage you to uh, donate to Iron USA to support the, the projects just like the ones um, that our panelists shared about uh, today. Um, so today on Giving Tuesday, we are participating in this great day of global giving and uh, Iron has already raised over $5,000 today. And our goal, which is quite um, quite lofty is to raise 15,000. Uh, so we're, we're, we're getting there and we would love it if, um, uh, if we could get a little closer and uh, meet and exceed our goal. There are a couple ways that you can donate. You can donate uh, via Facebook. Um, maybe one of my colleagues can help put the link in the chat box to uh, how to donate on Facebook and also donate on, on PayPal. Um, we, we also have a lot of uh, people in our Iron community who have made fundraisers on behalf of Iron USA. So thank you all who've already, to, to everybody who's already donated, thank you so much. And thank you to uh, the people who are fundraising on behalf of Iron. Um, so with that, uh, thinking about um, uh, Giving Tuesday and coming in the US, we just had our Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so kind of in the spirit of Thanksgiving, um, I, thank you all so much for joining us for this webinar and may your hearts be full of, of thanks and, and also giving. Thank you everybody.